uh, we have uh, looked at four different signs that Jesus performed, uh, signs that authenticated his being the Messiah, being the Christ, uh, and that in him, he's a worthy uh, one to put our faith in him. Uh, the first miracle was the sign which was in the realm of creation and joy, and it was at a wedding. Remember that? Turning the water to wine. That was the first sign that we saw in the book of John. The second one, really, uh, I think it was a sign in the sense that it demonstrated something important, and that was that Jesus was in the temple precincts, and it was the realm of religion and worship, where he came and just out of his own spontaneous uh, response, uh, cleansed the temple and drove the money changers out, which I don't think anybody had the guts to do <laughs> up to that time, but he had the passion to do that. And then number three, it was uh, in the realm of disease. Uh, remember the father that was uh, distraught over his son being to the point of death, and he was asking that he might heal his son, and Jesus uh, demonstrated his authority or his power over disease. And then last time we talked about the realm of morality. It was really the man who was lying beside the pool of Bethesda, and uh, he had been there for 38 years, and he was without hope, and uh, Jesus later on told him, uh, told him that he should stop sinning. So it, it has to, whether he was saved or not, we're not sure, but it was uh, in the realm of morality with this man and it demonstrated Jesus' power to heal. And after this came a great deal of controversy. If you know about Jesus, he somehow would push buttons and uh, people around him were provoked and uh, the Jews especially were uh, provoked. One of the reasons was that he was preaching on the Sabbath. He was breaking their Sabbath laws. And one of the most astounding things were is that here was this man who had been lying beside the pool for 38 years. How old were you 38 years ago? You don't have to tell me out loud. <laughs> who said that? Anyway... Uh, <laughs> I know that was going to be a snide remark from the back row there. So, <laughs> Anyway, so after 38 years, though, Jesus walks in uh, to, by this pool and sees all this humanity lying around the pool, waiting for the waters to be stirred. And Jesus, moved with compassion, heals this man, cause, tells him to stand up, take up your bed, go home. And uh, so that's exactly what happened. And the Jewish, Jewish leader's response to that was, it really doesn't matter too much about that man. What really matters is whether the Sabbath was being broken by the Lord Jesus. And it was a continual thing where they had religion, they had the, the old uh, covenant, which they were fearlessly trying to go by and pro uh, to protect, but here was a man, a human being, who was in need, and who was in need of a touch, or needing an, in, in need of the ministry and the power of Jesus in his life. And after 38 years, this man got up, took, out, took up his bed, and went home, and then he was later in the temple. But all I can say is I think our faith, the faith of Christ, the, re the religion, uh, uh, the Christian faith is about people and it is about uh, meeting the needs, the real needs of people. So if you look around you, there are needs everywhere. We don't have to watch CNN to see the needs around us. We just look across the street. We can look wherever we work and uh, the church is gathered but the church scatters too, and we are scattered all through the week, and we have plenty of opportunities to serve and love and preach and proclaim to the people around us, don't we? So, so here we are in the book of John. What a great place 
to jump in. Uh, <clears throat> this is going to be kind of like bam, 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 and you may get lost in this unless you have a pencil and you want to jot this down. But I just want to say that when it comes to the person of Jesus Christ and who is he, who is he that we worship? What is his identity? Uh, is he just a man? Is he just a prophet? Is he just a good teacher? Is he an example for us to follow? You know, and some people have even said, was he crazy? Was he a lunatic? Was he a liar? Or is he the Lord that deserves our worship? That's just an important question. And this passage of scripture written by the Apostle John and an eyewitness of the events in the life of Jesus, he, uh, without hesitation, uh, writes down for us, records the fact that Jesus is God, that Jesus deserves worship, that he deserves to be honored, that he deserves all glory and all power, and he's in charge. He is, he's, he does, his words, his teachings, his uh, uh, precepts are for us to follow and to listen and to pay attention to. There was a theologian of days gone by named Louis Burkhoff, and here's what he said that we find in Scripture. So before we get into John chapter 5, just want to quickly, in sort of bullet point ways, share a little bit of what he said. The scriptures clearly tell us that Jesus is God. The scriptures clearly tell us over and over again that Jesus is God, the deity of the Son. So, first of all, the scripture explicitly asserts the deity of the Son. I'm just going to give you one scripture instead of five. John 1.1 1, 1 says, in the beginning, if you go back as far as you can to the beginning, was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. John 1.1. 1, 1. So, in many other scriptures too, but that one explicitly says, Jesus, the Word, was God. Secondly, the scripture applies divine names to him. He has divine names. I could give you many examples, but uh, in Jeremiah chapter 23, verses 5 and 6, it says, Behold, the days are coming, declares the Lord, when I will raise up for David a righteous branch, and he shall reign as king and deal wisely, and shall execute justice and righteousness in the land. In his days, Judah will be saved, and Israel will dwell securely. And this is the name by which he will be called. He will be called the Lord, our righteousness. He will be called, his name will be the Lord, capital L, capital O, capital R, capital D our righteousness, speaking of Christ. The scripture, thirdly, ascribes to him divine attributes. Uh, for example, characteristics, divine, things that only belong to God. For example, eternal existence. Some people think that we, were, we exist eternally, but we were born. We were created in the womb, and then we were given says that uh, God breathed into the first man the breath of life, but, but he was not eternal. But uh, Jesus is eternally existence. For example, in John 1, 1 and 2, again, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the imperative, I'm sorry, the uh, imperfect tense which means he was God. It wasn't just he was God, he was God. He's always been God. He is, the scriptures tell us that he is eternal. Uh, then uh, it says that he is omnipresent. Um, he can say, for example, in Matthew 18, 20, for where two or three are gathered together in my name, there I am 
among them. He is omni, all, everywhere, present. Thirdly, uh, the next one is that he is omniscient. That means he knows everything. I want you to just turn with me for a minute to Revelation chapter 2. If you want to spend some really good time thinking about the church, thinking about God's uh, analysis of the church, look at Revelation chapter 2. We have here his assessment of the churches of Asia Minor. There were seven of them. And uh, in Revelation chapter 2, I'm getting there. Uh, beginning with verse 1, <clears throat> this is his analysis of the church at Ephesus. This just shows me that he is omniscient. He knows everything. He knows what goes on in this church. He knows everything. Omniscient means he knows it all. There's no surprises. There's nothing that we hide. There's no darkness that we hide in. God is very much aware of what we're doing, how we're doing, and, and so on. So uh, Revelation 2, 1 says, To the angel of the church of Ephesus write, The words of him who holds the seven stars in his right hand, who walks among the seven golden lampstands, I know, <laughs> I know your works, your toil, and your patient endurance, and how you cannot bear with those who are evil, but have tested those who call themselves apostles and are not, and found them to be false. I know you are enduring patiently and bearing up for my name's sake, and you have not grown weary. But I have this against you, that you have abandoned the love you had at the first. I mean, you can just read the whole passage. God knows his people. God knows the church. God is omniscient. And so this is the, the Christ. This is speaking of the Lord Jesus in his omniscience. The scripture tells us that he is omniscient. He is also omnipotent. Uh, I could pick a, a ton of scriptures for this, but here's one that's very encouraging to me. Hopefully, if you have some aches and pains and you've been taking a lot of ibuprofen or Tylenol or, you know, you've got some uh, Bengay or what, deep heat or something like that because you have aches and pains. Here's what it says. He is the um, omnipotent one. And it says in Philippians chapter 3, verse 21, who will transform our lowly body to be like his glorious body by the power that enables him even to subject all things to himself. He's going to be able by his power to transform lowly bodies. Is that good? Yeah. Amen. I heard a few of you. Uh, he's also immutable. The, the scriptures tell us that he is unchanging. He is, doesn't change his mind. He doesn't go back and forth. He is the same. It says in Hebrews chapter 1, verse 10, And you, Lord, laid the foundation of the earth in the beginning, and the heavens are the work of your hands. They will perish, but you remain. You remain. They will all wear out like a garment, like a robe. You will roll them up like a garment. They will be changed. But you are the same, and your years will have no end. You are immutable, unchanging. Um, and then he, uh, we've already said that he has divine names. It speaks of Jesus being able to do what only God can do. Only God can create. Only God can uh, speak and, and make and create the worlds around us. So John 1, 3 says, all, th all things were made. All things were made through him. And without him was not anything made that was made. So it speaks of Jesus being involved in creation. Uh, it, it speaks of Jesus as being involved in providence. Luke 10, 22, all things have been handed over to me by the Father. Luke 10, 22. Here's another one. 
Jesus is given the ability to forgive sins. There's no other place on the planet to go to experience the forgiveness of sin. Our culture is learning how to throw rocks at people who make mistakes. We are learning how to cancel people who, uh, in, in certain people's minds, do things that they don't agree with. There's no redemption. There is no redemption for many that we see on the news channels today. There's no place to turn for the forgiveness of sin, the cleansing of God through the cross of Jesus. There's no place to turn. There is no place to turn among the, the teachings of the Quran. You know that? There is none. When you die, you just have to say, I hope that I did more good deeds than I did bad deeds. That's the only hope. There is no redemption. There is no forgiveness through the cross of Christ. Uh, and so we know that Jesus, to him, uh, it was attributed the one who could forgive sins. Uh, and when Jesus <clears throat> dealt with a paralytic, he said, take heart, my son, your sins are forgiven. And the Jews right away said, well, nobody can forgive sins except God himself, right? Well, that was a statement of the deity of Christ, the prerogative he has to forgive sin. And there's no place else to go on the planet for that, right? And then... Uh, well, let's go back to John chapter 5. And we'll just kind of stay there, I think. John chapter 5, verse uh, 22. For... The Father judges no one, but has given all judgment to the Son, that all may honor the Son, just as they honor the Father. Whoever does not honor the Son does not honor the Father who sent him. Jesus deserves honor. Jesus deserves worship. If we cannot worship Jesus, we cannot worship the Father. If, if uh, Jesus would say um, that all may honor the Son just as they honor the Father, whoever does not honor the Son does not honor the Father who sent him. In this place, the Jews immediately knew that Jesus was claiming equality with God the Father. Jesus was claiming to be God, to be equal with God, and they took up stones. In fact, again, I read this last week in verse chapter 5, verse 18. This was why the Jews were seeking all the more to kill him. Because not only was he breaking the Sabbath, which he was, but he was even calling God his own father, making himself equal with God. Jesus was making himself equal with God. And this scripture says that he must be honored. He must be worshipped. Um, so we've already learned from last week that Jesus is equal, equal to God the Father in nature. Right? And secondly, he is equal to God in power. The healings, the miracles, the signs that he performed. He, Jesus said in Chapter 5, verse 19, Truly, truly, I say to you, the Son can do nothing of His own accord, but only what He sees the Father doing for whatever the Father does. This is power. Whatever the Father does, 
that the Son does likewise. <laughs> so if the Father raises the dead and gives them life, that's what Jesus does. If, if the Father uh, restores a paralytic to health, that's what Jesus does. He, has, he is equal to God in power. And finally, I just want you to go to the third point. So I'm just reviewing a little bit from last week. But Christ is equal to the Father in authority. In authority. This is where many of the systems of government in our world are struggling. It has to do with authority. Those who are totalitarian, those who are dictators, those who want to be in the highest place in a country, even in the world, uh, the, the fact that um, they, they need to be and want to be in the place of highest authority. They do not want to have um, Christ over them. The, the rules, the precepts, the teachings of Christ over them. They don't want to stand before the Lord someday and have to give an account to the Creator. One time, a friend of mine, and I won't give the details on this, but he was uh, looking, meeting with a government official in a country which is not a Christian country at all, and he was meeting with this person who had a an AK-47 around his waist. And uh, there was a confrontation there. And it took courage to stand. And there was the request for permission from this non-Christian government to, uh, to exist as a, as a Christian organization. And, and he said, I know I'm, he looked at this man who was carrying the gun and he said, you in this conversation, you have more power than I do. You have the power I don't. You have the human, on the human level, the authority and the power over me. But when he looked at him, he said, but I want to tell you, and you may not understand, but you may at your death Stand before the one who has ultimate power over you, who will be your judge. And so, um, my friend didn't die, uh, and, and God has had his gracious hands around that organization for a long time. But Christ has equal authority. What kind of authority does Christ have? You ready for this? And then we'll close, but I'm, I go to communion, but... This is the kind of authority that Christ has. And you can just jot these down if you like. Uh, just they're kind of some bullet points here. But first of all, he has, the, uh, he has the authority, and he does this. He has the authority to chasten and discipline the, the, the believer. You know that? He has the authority to chasten, which means to spank, or to discipline the believer. It's really clear. Look at Hebrews chapter 12. This is the authority of Christ. Hebrews and then James. Hebrews chapter 12. Um, when I was growing up, my parents had the authority to chasten and discipline me. And they did. At will. Many times. With whatever was handy. They had the authority over me and I respected their authority. Believe me, I did. I trembled when my mom would shake the drawer in the kitchen and I could hear the spoons rattling and the wooden spoons and I knew she was coming soon because she had the authority at that moment to chasten and to discipline me and my brother too. I mean, he was not guiltless and my sister. So, uh, you know, so that's true. But this says that Christ has the authority. Christ has the ultimate authority to chasten and discipline His children, and He will. I don't want Him to chasten me. I don't want to feel His wooden spoon on my backside. But He can do that if we rebel. 
So Hebrews chapter 12 and verse 5, it says, And have you forgotten the exhortation that addresses you as sons? Have you forgotten the exhortation that uh, addresses you as sons, as his kids? My son, do not regard lightly the discipline of the Lord, nor be weary when reproved by him, for the Lord disciplines, he chastens those the one that he loves and ch chastises every son whom he receives. Every son, every child of God is, needs to be afraid of the wooden spoon drawer and the chastening. And that's the authority that Christ has over his children. Uh, he is the final judge of all moral creatures. Every sphere of moral creature will one day stand face to face with Jesus who has been given the authority to judge. And so the first realm of his judgment might be uh, the church. The churches. Look at 2 Corinthians chapter 5. 2 Corinthians chapter 5 <clears throat> and verse 10. It says, For we believers, the church, Christians, those who name the name of Jesus, who say, I'm going to go to heaven someplace, someday I'm not going to go to hell by God's grace. It says, We must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ. We're all going to have a day to stand before the Lord in all of His authority, in all of His ability to judge fairly and righteously. We all must stand before the judgment seat of Christ so that each one happily, <laughs> wonderfully, may receive what is due, may be rewarded for what is due. But we will stand before the Lord who, will, who has the authority even to do that. So he will be the final judge of the church. Um, he will be the final judge of the nation of Israel. That's if you believe in, in eschatology and what the scriptures teach about the nation of Israel and individual Jews, uh, you would only have to go to Matthew chapter 24, uh, 27 through 25, 10 and 11. You can just study it on your own. But there will be a time of accounting by the nation of Israel. And then, uh, thirdly, Gentiles... At the time that the second coming happens, when Christ returns, Revelation chapter 19, uh, when there will be a time of judgment given to Christ at, at the second coming of Christ to the earth, uh, and Gentiles will be judged, the sheep will be separated from the goats. That would be found in Matthew chapter 25, verse 31 through 46. There's also uh, several passages that deal with him judging angels. <laughs> Even angels are going to face the authority and the glory of Christ Jesus. Uh, angels, probably at the end of the millennium, will experience the judgment of God. And then probably the most fearful to me, the, because we're human, look at Revelation chapter 20. I turn here a lot because I feel like it should motivate our life should motivate our life to live holy, to be salt, to be light, to preach the gospel, to share the good news, to go away and into the lives of the people around us with the good news of Christ wherever we go. But um, this is the final judgment of the wicked dead, those who do not bow before Christ. And Revelation chapter 20, verse 12 uh, says... Um, 
And I saw the dead, great and small, standing before the throne, and books were opened. Then another book was opened, which is the book of life, and the dead were judged by what was written in the books according to what they had done. And the sea gave up the dead who were in it. Death and Hades gave up the dead who were in them. And they were judged, each one of them, according to what they had done. And then death and Hades were thrown into the lake of fire. This is the second death, the lake of fire. And if anyone's name was not found written in the book of life, he was thrown into the lake of fire. That's the final judgment. Christ deserves to be honored because of his moving among the lampstands of the churches, but also he has the authority for final judgment. And uh, he deserves to be honored. <clears throat> Let me just close with these words from Revelation chapter 5 and 4. Says, Worthy are you, our Lord and God, to receive glory and honor and power, for you created all things, and by your will they existed and were created. Worthy are you, Jesus, to take the scroll and to open its seals, for you were slain, and by your blood you ransomed people for God from every tribe and language and people and nation, and you have made them a kingdom and priests to our God, and they shall reign upon the earth. Worthy is the Lamb who was slain to receive power and wealth and wisdom and might and honor and glory and blessing. Jesus deserves honor, and that's what exactly we find in John chapter 5. To him who sits on the throne and to the Lamb, be blessing and honor and glory and might forever and ever. And all God's people said, Amen. 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 Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we come to you this morning in the name of our Savior Jesus. Lord, we come humbly, we come understanding that it is by grace that any man, any woman, any young person will ever see heaven. It is by grace. It is by the unearned, unmerited, undeserved favor of God that anyone will see heaven. We thank you for grace, Father. We thank you that salvation from the wrath, from the punishment, from the judgment of God uh, comes through faith in Christ. There is now therefore no condemnation to them which are in Christ Jesus. There is no condemnation. There is no throwing stones. There is no canceling. There is no um, anything to the one who is in Christ Jesus there is grace and forgiveness and cleansing and hope and in the end, eternal life. So God, we thank you today. As we come to the communion table, I pray, Lord, we would remember again that the price was paid at Calvary, that the cross, on the cross, Christ bore our sin. Christ absorbed the punishment for sin, for sinners, and offers to every sinner, the gift of eternal life. Father, we thank you for Jesus. We thank you that he was willing to leave the, the glories of heaven, that he condescended, that he was made for a while in the form and the likeness of men. And he humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death, even death on the cross. So Lord, thank you for his obedience, his willing heart. But Lord, thank you too that he was exalted and highly exalted and now occupies a royal place in heaven and he is to be honored and glorified. 
We thank you that he is the living and resurrected Christ. And Lord, when we take communion, we are remembering him in all of his glory. So Lord, help us to do that today with a grateful heart. And we pray this in Christ's name.